Good morning, everyone. It is my great pleasure to welcome you today at UNESCO headquarters in Paris, uh, where we, we just inaugurated an exhibition, Artivism for Living. And today I'm very honored to host uh, this panel discussion on Web3, NFT, and environment. My name is Irina Karagaur. I'm the founder of BQ9 and the head of ecosystem growth at Unique Network, as well as head ambassador for Western Europe at Polkadot Ecosystem. So uh, we will start with the introductions. Uh, I'm welcoming today here Alessandro Mazzi, uh, the head of partnerships and field research at Sovereign Nature Initiative, Sharfi. Adam Entin, uh, the CEO of Gain Forest, and Audric Bal Bal Balsa, <laughs> excuse me, a senior climate expert and Greenly. Uh, Greenly is the leading carbon footprint measurement company in France, uh, certified by the Ministry of Environmental Transition, working on key corporate brands to measure their NFT products and campaigns. And so. Um, our discussion today is going to be around the new technology, Web3, um, non-fungible tokens, and their positive impact on the environment and how we can use this new technology and innovation to power environmental solutions, to improve uh, our environment, to improve our lives, and to improve participation of civil society in um, topics like climate action and adaptation. Um, a little bit of background about myself. Um, I joined Web3, I'm an architect. I studied urban planning and policy design in Italy and then moved to management consulting, worked with design, with policies, with master planning, um, sort of changed many different hats. And then I moved to London in 2016 and began looking at prop tech industry and different applications um, of technology on the build environment uh, and how we can improve the urban spaces, improve the way we live. Um, and in 2019, I finally founded uh, my own company. And then in 2020, I joined Polkadot as an ambassador. Um, Polkadot ecosystem attracted me by the people mainly, by the community. Uh, decentralization and the opportunities everybody, technical and non-technical, can have in this space. Um, how anybody can easily join this community, learn about the technology, learn about the opportunities, and actually drive the change using the help of different tools such as treasury, um, education hub, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, in 2021, I joined one of the Polkadot ecosystem teams, Unique Network. Uh, Unique Network is the NFT parachain on Polkadot. We specialize in advanced features. Uh, we're working with uh, fantastic projects over in nature, uh, Snark Art, Lemonade Social. Lemonade Social uh, actually launched the POAP uh, for this event. Um, you can visit Lemonade uh, Social Network and claim your POAP for uh, attending an exhibition today. Uh, and in 2021, when I joined Unique Network, uh, we began onboarding different initiatives. And uh, Miroslav Polzer, Dr. Miroslav Polzer, approached me during the conference with the proposal to launch an NFT at the COP26 in Glasgow. So we began preparing um, this initiative. and. Back in the day, uh, Ethereum was still proof of work. Uh, the perception of blockchain industry was still that it's polluting, it's consuming too much energy, um, it's inefficient, it's bad, bad, bad. We, we need something else. But uh, it happens that Polkadot was already operational. There were many uh, other ecosystems, other blockchains who operated on proof of stake, uh, which is a a validation mechanism, uh, the way that the network is supported. Uh, there are different nodes, different computers that uh, execute mining functions for the blockchains to run. And 
proof of stake, and in case of Polkadot, it's nominated proof of stake, uh, it just happens to be more efficient because you need less computer power to um, support the network. Uh, and at the time, many uh, blockchains and many communities uh, began educating on the subject of blockchain being good for the environment. Uh, many studies were produced. You can refer to Crypto um, Research Institute paper, UCL University research paper that actually shows comparison of different blockchains to um, existing payment systems um, such as Visa, MasterCard, um, or Netflix consumption or YouTube consumption of electricity and production of CO2. So um, we began working on this initiative for COP26 uh, and we decided to launch Digital Art for Climate Initiative. We decided to gather a community of artists, make an art competition and open the dialogue for everybody, uh, an education, launch an education for everyone to learn about climate change, to learn about the new technology and to get together on one platform and find solutions on how we can improve the current process of um, fundraising for the environmental initiatives, of creating awareness, of creating real impact, of de re delivering real impact. Um, so uh, in Glasgow, we launched the first ever NFT collection. This year, uh, we had participated in COP27 with already Digital Innovation Pavilion. And we are all already preparing for uh, COP28. And today here we have a large and the first in history um, exhibition that showcases the positive impact of NFTs and application of Web3 technology for the environment. So with that said, um, I would like to ask Alessandro to um, give his um, view on on the space, on the project he's working in, and share his personal story of how did you, Alessandro, uh, join the Web3 and uh, what's next? Sure, yeah, thanks, uh, thanks, Irina, for the uh, wonderful introduction and warm up to this conversation. Um, so, I'm Al Alessandro Mazzi, I'm uh, uh, head of partnerships and field research at the Sovereign Nature Initiative. Um, before I get into what we do, maybe a bit of a background on how I, uh, I landed. Uh, working in this company. Um, so my background is in uh, international public and environmental law and um, right after my studies I joined the technology field looking at how we can use technology for uh, sustainability. So I worked in different uh, projects that were looking at questions of uh, value and, um, and, and managing resources and so on. Um, but I would say my, uh, throughout this whole journey, uh, maybe because of my sensitivity towards the natural world, I always asked myself the question, um, how can we, um, humans, um, uh, develop practices and uh, in, in a way that is more attuned to uh, the natural world? Like when I studied law, for instance, I learned that we give subjectivity and, um, and a right and a, w a personhood to ourselves as humans and even to corporations, these abstract ideas um, and, and entities that we create to manage business, but we don't extend those rights to the rest of the living and we treat them as objects that we can manage and manipulate. And even if we look at like how we're handling uh, ecological, uh, if you want to call it eco uh, e economies, um, we still treat them, treat the living world as a resource to be explored and we see the benefits from what we can extract from it. So all these questions were very present to me, uh, which were very philosophical questions. And um, I was seeing that in the industry there was not much, uh, much progress being done, but there was an opportunity in 2017 when I joined the Web3 uh, blockchain at that time, it was called a Space, um, to represent ecosystems and give uh, give personhood through, uh, to ecosystems through technology. So, um, for instance, uh, there were conversations at the time, 2017-18, about um, 
forests owning themselves and being able to manage their own money, which would sound utopian, but uh, it's actually now possible with the type of data that we get from uh, satellites and, and other uh, remote sensing um, and on the ground sensing as well technologies. So uh, through that inquiry, I met um, in uh, 2019 the Sovereignty Initiative, which was um, just emerging as, as an idea whereby we were trying to, they were trying to really ask this question of um, uh, transcending the separation between human and the rest of the living and looking at economies that would value nature more for being alive than dead. Um, uh, let's say I got in stayed in touch with the organization for a while and then in 2021 it was actually officially established and I joined as the first um, employee. Um, the Sovereignty Initiative is a Dutch uh, non-for-profit based uh, in the Netherlands, in Amsterdam, um, and the focus of the work is on ecology, um, but interpreted as to what some people will refer, refer to as deep ecology, so like seeing uh, the relationship between different organisms, including humans, and the influence that humans have on, on um, the um, living world on the biosphere. Um, economy, so looking critically at how we value scarce resources and how we can start to value in a more regenerative uh, way uh, the environment. And then thirdly, uh, on we look at technologies, so uh, emerging technologies, not only Web3, but also machine learning and AI, and how can that be used not as a, a way to manage and control and manipulate and exploit, but as a way uh, through uh, towards more regenerative practices. Um, so, the, um, as we, um, we were exploring where impact could be made most uh, at the beginning uh, in 2021, we found that uh, community-led conservation and, let's say, stewardship of land was the, the uh, uh, let's say, a niche that was interesting to look into because it was tackling the issue. So, community-led conservation is basically the idea of um, getting communities that live adjacent to uh, um, protected areas, like uh, by biodiverse areas, to include them in the work of, con of conservation. So it's not just these big NGOs doing the work and receiving the monies and the benefits, but including the communities that live and actually paid most of the costs of living with uh, wild, uh, wild species. So as we, as we were looking at the, the industry of community-led conservation and some of the projects we stumbled upon, the Kenya Wildlife Trust, which is an NGO that really focuses most of their work on community engagement in the conservation of predators in the Masai Mara uh, uh, region in Kenya. Um, and we decided to partner with them to explore um, uh, possibilities on how technology could be applied to support their work and efforts. And um, this was 12 uh, months ago. Um, we have uh, run uh, an R&D project with them and basically what um, I can share now, maybe leave it to later from details, but basically mo most of the struggles that these community-led conservation uh, projects are facing is um, finding ways to continuously fund their work um, and then being able to distribute whatever money value that is created to the the ones that are really you know paying the costs or that would should be receiving the benefits of um, um, of the regeneration conservation work that is done, the way that funds are now attracted in that specific region is through uh, ecotourism, which is very heavy on on the land and is also not the most resilient economic model because uh, COVID happens, for instance, right? And there's no tourism, uh, there's no money influx, hence. The whole idea of protecting that area because of tourism um, collapses completely. Other ways of funding is, is through philanthropy, but that would mean that basically the work that uh, conservation people do is most of the time about trying to find money rather than doing the actual work in the field. Um, so the question to us for us was how can we create value systems through this abundance that is offered, for instance, through Web3, um, 
to to fund this uh, this conservation efforts and projects in these communities that are doing the work uh, without ha them having to either go back to extractive practices like agriculture um, or heavy um, 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 grazing, for instance, of cattle, um, and still do and focus most of their work on on the protection of uh, of these wild ecosystems. So I, I'll be happy to share more, but I think that's enough for an introduction. Thank you, Alessandro. Um, Sharfi, could you please tell us your story? How did you get into Web3 and um, more about your project? Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Alessandro. We are definitely very aligned in a lot of our viewpoints. So a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Sharfi Adamanti, and I'm one of the co-founders of Gainforest. Uh, Gainforest is a nonprofit organization, and our goal is to prevent deforestation and to also reverse it by reforestation. So right now, deforestation is probably accounts to 18% of all carbon human carbon emissions. Um, and a lot of this is kind of through cattle grazing, um, but also extracting the resources that's inside the rainforest. And really what we want to do in Gain For Us is what you just touched on a couple of minutes ago, is how do we create a sustainable ecosystem where we empower the people on the ground to really protect their land and, um, you know, they have to earn money somehow, they have to live. And one of the viable ways of doing that right now is through ecotourism. Um, but that is also very heavy on the land. So what we do is we try to um, connect donors from all around the world, and we do this through through NFTs, through Web3, in a way that's very engaging, um, in a way that shows that the rainforest is actually being protected. So, um, yeah, just that's kind of uh, what Gain Forest is about. And... Uh, yeah, community is at the core of 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 everything that we do. Everything that we do is is designed by by the community. Um, a little bit about how I got into it. I had so I've always had an interest in climate, and I've always tried to figure out what is how do we use technology to better um, to better protect our climate. Um. <coughs> And uh, I have a background in civil and environmental engineering. And after that, I went to to, to the Web3 world. I, uh, I'm a programmer. And um, the, the, the whole question of how do we make, how do we have engagement? Um, ecotourism is one of it. Uh, when you use NFTs, you can ha uh, have a visual visualization of the rainforest that you're trying to protect. and um, everything is very dynamic, and so uh, as a donor, I have proof that the forest is being protected because I can see with my own eyes camera traps that we collect on the ground. These are all given to you. Um, it's very engaging. It's um, right now, if you want to donate to a nonprofit, if you have um, if you or your business has a, a dedicated climate fund and you're, you're interested in figuring out how do I offset my car carbon footprint, you can choose a, a couple of organizations, but you don't actually know where that money is going. A lot of it is very opaque. And at Gainforest, radical transparency is, is everything that we, um, that we stand for. Uh, so when once you donate to the Gain Forest platform, you will be able to really see the impact because every month or every couple of months, we get satellite data, camera trap data, and you as a donor, you can go into our platform, um, you can log in using the NFT that you have purchased, and all of this is dynamic. You can really see um, the people that live there, the animals that are present, you know, what is their story? It's it's really a way to connect and tell tell the story more so than just okay, we are we're currently in a climate climate crisis. There is a lot of um, ways that we can offset that, um, but in 
in regards to the rainforest particularly you will be more engaged if you know as a donor that you know this amount of money that you're putting into the rainforest is actually making an impact and it's all done using one simple trick um, once you donate the money doesn't actually get released unless we have proof um, and this could be done using satellite images camera images and um, the community can go measure trees so once you have proof every month that the the forest is actually intact then the fu the money goes directly to the communities and this funds their livelihood it's a way for them to also be engaged in protecting their rainforest and uh, like i said earlier everything is very community-led so they also get to choose themselves for example um, we were working with the indigenous community in Brazil and uh, when we were trying to figure out where to install camera images, camera traps, mm, they because they live in the land, they know very well, okay, here there is an animal den or, you know, over here there might sometimes the, the jaguars come to hunt. So, so they have really such great uh, connection with the nature and we're trying to give them a voice, give them a platform and also for us to be able to learn from them as much as they are learning from us um, I have so many stories we we teach them how to use cameras um, so they there's um, they become photographers actually we have these like teenage indigenous people and they um, they can see plants and image and and animals in a way that I would never be able to see uh, when I was there in Brazil a couple of weeks ago. Um, I was just hanging out with them and they were like, look, right there, there's a baby nest, like um, a bird nest. And I was like, I would look at the tree and I was playing like, spot the bird. And they're like, come here, here, I'll give you your, um, show me, give me your camera. And then they took pictures. So, so all of these images, mm, for them, it's also a way to, to show and to show their the, the animals that are living there it's a way for us as a donor to engage and all of this is visible through a very transparent system um, that we can talk about in a bit thank you Sharfi um, it's a very inspiring story and very real and applicable mm -hmm. and this is what excites me the most about web3 that we can have impact, we can measure it, we can track it, and we can have that real-time data and transparency, uh, and everybody can participate uh, in this project initiative. That's really fascinating. And now, Audric, um, over to you. Uh, what is your story about getting into Web3, and what are you working on? Thank you, and hi, everyone. Uh, so yeah, to present myself briefly, I'm uh, Audric Balsa. Uh, I got uh, an engineer background in uh, in generalist field, uh, but I worked in uh, in telecommunications first, uh, so run technologies. Uh, in the meantime, uh, I learned a lot about climate change. I read uh, a lot of books. Uh, I documented myself, and I wanted to to really contrib contribute to to this cause. So I joined uh, the company called Greenly uh, a few a few time ago. Uh, to present Greenly, it's uh, it's the, the the leading company in France uh, uh, working on uh, carbon assessments for companies. Uh, so we're working uh, with uh, a lot of clients, uh, mainly SMEs uh, in France. Uh, our goal is really to democratize the the carbon assessment and make it available to everyone. Uh, to do this, uh, we use a platform. So it's a digitalized ca carbon assessment uh, to simplify all the process. Um, so it's, uh, it helps SMEs to, to do their carbon assessments. We also work with bigger companies on uh, other projects. Uh, and personally, I'm, uh, I'm, um, I'm speci specialized around the, the digital uh, assessment uh, and all the new technologies and to, to measure the, the impact of new technologies arriving because there are a lot of questions about it uh, in in the companies like 
every company wants to, to launch uh, new new campaigns, new com marketing campaigns uh, using using Web3, using NFTs, uh, all things like that. Uh, but there, there's a, a duality uh, around this, uh, this subject because there are people who just want to launch, uh, launch thi these campaigns because it's new and it's attractive. Uh, but there are also ESG, ESG, um, ESG engagement from the companies and we want to really know what's the impact of the solutions that are being launched. Um, so that's what I, I've been working with um, for, for some companies uh, in France. Uh, so I I, um, I did the, the carbon assessments, uh, for example, of uh, of uh, uh, marketing campaigns uh, around uh, the launch of uh, of uh, thousands of uh, of NFTs uh, for 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 brand for for its community. The the goal was to to engage the community because it it's uh, it's something that we can uh, we can make with, with the NFTs. Like you, you possess something from the brand and you can give access to to specific uh, specific products, uh, specific uh, specific uh, news, everything. Uh, but beyond that, um, there is also a very uh, critical aspect uh, around the around the carbon footprint of all these new technologies, uh, and I think it's something that we always want to think about when we use uh, emerging technologies. Um, Usually, uh, usually all the new technologies are very appealing, uh, but uh, there's, al there's also uh, what we call a, a, a rimbad effect sometimes. Uh, like we use new technology, we think that it's uh, a revolution and uh, and everything, but actually it makes us consume more energy and more more resources. And, and it happens actually with uh, with the blockchain. You you talk about it every now uh, with uh, what we call the proof of work uh, used by the the biggest blockchains. Um, so, for for example, Ethereum was based on blockchain using uh, using proof of work. And I, I I did the study about the, the carbon footprint, but we will talk about it uh, a little bit later. I think uh, what I can say is that it's really shocked me actually uh, i was expecting a really big impact but it was even higher than what i expected uh, but there are also a uh, very efficient way to to lower these emissions uh, linked to to all the blockchains uh, use usage um, and i think the, that's what we will discuss uh, right after this uh, this presentation uh, so yeah, and to to come back to to Greenly, uh, so we are speci specialized in the in the carbon assessments. So the first step actually is to to measure the emissions of the of the companies, but after that we also help them to reduce the, the their emissions. That's the first big important step. Uh, our goal is also to simplify the way uh, they can reduce their emissions by. Uh, giving them advices on the, the best uh, levers to activate in their companies, uh, to help them measure the the impact that uh, an action could have uh, to 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 reduce uh, a particular uh, activity in the in in the their workflow in the company. And the the first part is for the the emissions that cannot be reduced because. Every company has to to work, and there there will always be emissions uh, to to conduct an activity. So for this part, we also want to to, to propose them uh, uh, an easy way to contribute to sequest sequest sequestration projects or uh, carbon reduction projects. Uh, and for that, uh, for now, what we what we're doing. Is that uh, we we're doing a lot of work at selecting projects uh, that are certified with uh, certified actors, uh, but even for those projects, for those classical projects, uh, it's quite difficult to really see uh, the the impact that we really have uh, 
by, by uh, buying uh, uh, carbon, uh, carbon certificates. Uh, so uh, I think the, the really added value of, uh, of something like, uh, like, like Web3 and uh, NFTs uh, around this product is really about uh, the transparency uh, and I think it can help, uh, help people and help companies to, to be more aware of what is possible to do with this project and help them to, to get engaged on those kind of projects uh, and spread uh, all, this, uh, all this stuff to, to help uh, fight uh, climate change. Thank you, Audric. Um, I'm very excited to dive into the numbers and the actual impact uh, of NFT. But before we move to the discussion on carbon emissions and uh, energy efficiency of Web3, I actually want to ask our audience, uh, do you know what Web3 is? Have you heard before the term Web3 before you came to this discussion? Great. And you, uh, have you heard of NFTs? Do you know what NFT is? Uh, so this tells me that uh, NFT is already part of our life and Web3 is part of our life. And this is very encouraging because two years ago, this was so new, um, so mysterious that um, it, it's great that all the work that has been done by Web3 community um, actually has uh, an impact and um, people understand what, what Web3 is and why we're building it. Um, however, before we jump into the discussion, I would like each of you to just in one sentence say what Web3 is for you. Okay, <laughs> I, I, I can start. Uh, for me, I, yeah, Web3 is uh, like just a, a, a new way uh, of thinking and of uh, collaborating. For me, Web3 uh, signifies transparency. So this it means transparency in specifically, in our case, in donations. Um, so when you donate to a project, you know for sure that that money goes to the communities and not just to someone else's bank account. And you can really see this using the Web3 technology. Yeah, in one sentence, it's quite a task. Um, <laughs> I think Web3, before a technology, is a, is a cultural movement. It's a set of beliefs about um, the world and uh, as individuals, as communities. And I believe it's, it's, it's definitely enabling new type of collaboration between individuals and organizations and communities. So, um, yeah, that's, that's the way I like to see it before uh, what you can do with the technology itself and how the technology works. Great, thank you. Uh, and Audric, I would like to start our discussion on the impact of NFT. Um, so what is the impact of NFT in terms of carbon footprint? How big is this impact and how to measure it? Yeah, thank you. So about the impact uh, of NFTs, um, it really depends on the, the protocol of validation it's based on. Um, maybe I can start by explaining how we measure the impact uh, behind, uh, behind the, the NFTs and the use of, uh, of a blockchain. Um, so it's really based on, uh, on a physical uh, approach. Uh, basically, to validate uh, a, a, a transaction on a blockchain, uh, there are several kind of, uh, of protocols. Uh, the most impactful is uh, called the, the proof of work, uh, where we need a lot of compute power, uh, basically, to, uh, to, to validate a transaction. Um, this compute power consumes a lot of energy. Uh, it's so it's based on, uh, on CPUs and GPUs, uh, materials located in, uh, into, into big servers, uh, uh, and consuming a lot of a, a lot of energy and a lot of resources too, uh, but the impact is not only located on uh, on computing parts. It's also uh, 
in, in the storage part and the uh, data, data transfer part. Uh, it's because uh, blockchains are decentralized uh, systems, which means that it's replicated uh, hundreds of times, thousands of times. So each time it's replicated, uh, it has to be stored. Uh, there's data transfer uh, happening. Um, so about proof of work, uh, so it's it was used in Ethereum. It's used uh, around transactions with with Bitcoin, which is uh, which is the, the most well known. Um, but there are also uh, another mm, another way of validating transactions, which uh, is now used by Ethereum because they, they switched uh, a few months ago. Uh, considering all the ecological impact of proof of work, uh, which is called proof of stake, and which doesn't ask uh, validators to uh, to run a huge amount of compute power, uh, it's just ask uh, to 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 have a certain amount of uh, of uh, of cri cryptocurrencies of Ethereum, basically. Uh, to to validate uh, the transaction, so this uh, this proof of stake uh, is way more efficient in terms of uh, electrical consumption, uh, at least for the for the compute part, uh, and basi basically uh, in terms of uh, total emissions uh, globally, uh, proof of stake is. Uh, Persons, uh, like, like two or three persons of the of the old uh, proof of work, so it's a uh, really huge uh, gain in terms of CO2, in terms of uh, materials, because we don't have to uh, to to buy uh, hundreds of CPUs or GPUs to to validate the transactions. Uh, so to give uh, an order of uh, of magnitude of the impact of uh, of NFTs uh, with the if the blockchain is based on a proof of work system uh, for 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 hundreds uh, for thousands of NFTs, you will have uh, hundreds of tons of CO2. Um, for for Ethereum, the the old way Ethereum works with proof of work. Um, one transactions one transaction was equal to uh, the electrical consumption of uh, an house. Uh, an American household uh, for six days. So the, ener the amount of energy used for one transaction was really huge. Uh, and the, the consumption of uh, the blockchain Ethereum before the merge and the, the switch between proof of work and proof of stake was more or less equal to the energy consumption, uh, the electricity consumption of a country like uh, Finland. So it was really impressive, and it really impressed me, at least, uh, when I did the, the, this study. Uh, now, with the proof of stake, uh, it really lowered the energy consumption uh, ne necessary to do a transaction. Now, the levels of uh, carbon footprint of a, of a transaction on the with Ethereum is basically uh, in the order of magnitude of a, of a visa transaction. Actually, uh, it's one one transaction of in Ethereum is equal to approximately twenty transactions uh, on uh, the on the visa network, which is much more uh, efficient and much more acceptable. Um, but me. so I think it's. Uh, the best uh, lever to to reduce the carbon footprints of uh, of blockchain is uh, obviously to up to the to proof of stake uh, methodology to validate the transactions. Um, the the remaining uh, problem of uh, this uh, this system is um, the decentralization. It's Obviously, it, it's obviously uh, uh, something that has also uh, good good sides. Like uh, it's for the transparency, for the security, 
uh, it's something very interesting, uh, but it's on the carbon footprint part. Uh, it's um, it's obviously more more impactful si since the the transactions and uh, everything has to be replicated uh, hundreds or thousands uh, times, depending on the length on the on the blockchain and the number of uh, of validators of nodes on the blockchain. Yeah, also uh, the important macro factor here is that we're talking about fundamental transformation of, for example, financial system because blockchain gives a lot of benefits uh, to make transactions fast, transparent, and we're talking about millions and millions of transactions for any type of payment. So we need to make sure that the technology that is meant to replace conventional financial system uh, is environmentally friendly, mm. that we're not improving on one side but creating a damage on another side. We need to be responsible uh, for the technology we're building. We need to educate ourselves. We need to educate businesses, um, communities, organizations on the benefits, um, on the actual um, electricity consumption, on the amounts of CO2 it produces. Uh, but the big benefit of the blockchain is that it's transparent. So all the measurements, um, I imagine it is easier to track how much actually electricity is consumed by the blockchain as opposed to the conventional financial system. Because we, um, the measurements that I saw, we can, for example, see the uh, reports by Visa, but it only measures how many times you swipe the card. So we don't actually know um, how much is the industry consuming energy. Whereas in blockchain, um, if we think about the centralized nature of it, of the infrastructure, uh, we can be more precise. Is that true? Uh, I'd say it depends really on the blockchain actually. Uh, because, uh, so I, I worked a lot on Ethereum, for example. Uh, so I will take this example. Uh, to assess the carbon footprint of a transaction on Ethereum and therefore the, the electricity uh, consumption. Uh, we base ourselves on the location of uh, validators. So we have uh, pretty good information about the average location of uh, validators uh, on the blockchain. So that's a really good point since uh, carbon intensity of electricity is really different from a uh, country to another. Uh, the, the part of the real electricity consumption, uh, like uh, the kilowatt used uh, by the validators, can be a little bit more tricky to, uh, to assess precisely because we don't really know which device is behind uh, the, the validation, which devices are used to validate the transaction. So we have to, to make hypothesis uh, on this. Uh, but yeah, actually for, for Visa, for example, it's more or less the same, actually. Uh, we to really know uh, how they measure the, the impact of a transaction, we really have to deep dive into the, the methodology used to uh, to measure their, their carbon footprint, and this methodology uh, can really differ from one measurement to another. Uh, it's uh, it's there are some difference. Uh, what we call the the, the scope three in the GFG uh, emission reports, which is the the indirect indirect emissions uh, calculation, because it's a really uh, large category. And uh, the, the 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 measure de really depends on what uh, activities we measure or not in the scope. Uh, so it can have a, a huge impact and add uh, some incertitudes in the in the carbon measurement. Um, so how can we minimize this impact? Uh, not just by the technology itself, but we also have here uh, amazing initiatives that are taking it a, a step further. 
um, because it's important to have the base, to have the fundamentals in place and ensure that the infrastructure on which all the applications run is environmentally friendly, but it probably is not enough to just, you know, in the race uh, for 1.5 degree, um, which is still in place after the recent COP, we need to give that step forward. We need to make sure that initiatives um, are impactful, that the promises are delivered, and that we can see and measure how these initiatives practically transform people's life for the better and improve our, in our environment. Um, so my next question to all panelists uh, is how can NFT be leveraged to reduce the carbon footprint, track the wildlife, and orchestrate fundraising? So carbon removal applying for the whole blockchains. Um, and carbon footprints applied broadly to all industries. And we're also looking to uh, going to look into case studies of applying um, blockchain solutions to wildlife tracking and fundraising. Uh, so I would like to uh, begin with, again, going back to Audric's, uh, your um, analysis on different network. We are presenting uh, today here during the environmental um, exhibition, um, Reconciliation with the Living Polkadot Ecosystem um, by Crypto Research Institute um, studies. It showed that it has very low uh, energy consumption due to its nominated proof of stake. Uh, can you give us some comments if you worked with uh, different ecosystems? Can you give us very brief insight to each one of them? Um. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, to, to talk about this, um, the impact of, uh, of NFTs in terms of uh, appropriation of, of all these, uh, those projects I think it's a really interesting point uh, since, uh, as we see with the, all the, the art uh, presented here, uh, it can attract uh, new people on the, on the subject. Um, and what we are to see is, uh, w from one part, we, we calculate the, the impact of all this, uh, all this transaction. Uh, we see that uh, depending on the technology, it can be very high or uh, totally acceptable. Um, and which means that we can, once we make the, w once we made it acceptable, uh, we can look at the advantages versus the drawbacks of the solutions to to see uh, if we really want to deploy all these solutions. And if you want to deploy all these solutions, uh, there are a lot of ways to, to do it. Uh, so it can be hard, it can be uh, a lot of things. Actually, you, you may uh, talk about uh, this better than me. Um, but uh, yeah, I think th the goal is to broadly uh, share all those projects and make it available for, for everyone easily. Uh, so it can be uh, a really a real solution uh, to, to the problem. Um, so in order to execute these measurements correctly, would you need a feedback from the companies or can this information be collected independently or shell blockchain ecosystems um, come to one table as we're doing here today because we're representing different ecosystems? Um, and create standards, uh, share data, share some more information, detailed information on what that information should be uh, in order for companies like yours to perform better measurements on the environmental impact. Yeah, I think one point that would be great to uh, help us uh, have a better vision of the real impact uh, would be to have a standardized uh, 
uh, way of validating transactions uh, to know what is uh, really behind all these transactions, like for all the blockchains. Uh, so we would have uh, models uh, with um, s with specific devices, with specific uh, amount of data transferred, uh, stored uh, for the blockchain, which would help us uh, measure very precisely all the impact uh, of this transaction and track it for each, uh, each company running blockchains and using blockchains internally. Thank you. Um, I would like to move on to uh, the practical use cases and how this carbon footprint is applied in the industry, how it is important, what is the practical way your companies, your initiatives use work with uh, carbon footprint or why would you need to show the exact measurements, are they important uh, and also cover the practical initiatives of how this new technology, how NFT can help fundraise for specific initiatives. Um, and Sharfi, um, I would like to start with you. Thank you. Yeah, so definitely the carbon impact of using a technology has to be much less than, you know, what our projects are actually doing. You can't, if, if you claim to um, have an environmental project, you have to make sure that the technology underlying it is not worse than what you're trying to save. So this has been always been a big question for us. And um, for example, when even when Ethereum was proof of work, it was never an option. We did not even consider it. We didn't even consider any of its layer twos, like it, and any any technology that is related to Ethereum, because of the environmental footprint. And this is all also um, discussed with the community. Um, so this has always been a, a big topic with us as well. And for the, the technology that we use right now, um, each transaction is equal to two Google searches. So it's basically negligible if you use the internet. Two Google searches is nothing. Um, as for the practical aspects, um, like I've said earlier, all of it is about engaging the donor with what is on the ground. Um, right now, traditional monitoring technologies are pretty expensive because you have to pay a company to basically go on ground and measure the impact. They either have to make sure that the tree is actually still standing or in the case of tree planting projects, um, you can't just plant a tree and then leave it. You have to make sure that this tree is actually growing. So we, our technologies are bottom up and top to bottom. So the way that we make sure that a forest is actually intact is first we look through satellite images. And you can actually see um, through satellite images if there is forest that changes. Um, and satellite images are available depending on the region every five days or every month. The only thing that makes it difficult is if there are a lot of clouds. And then if for any reason the, um, the satellite images are a little bit fuzzy, then we also train the communities to fly drones, and this is a donation. And this is, you know, their proof that the forest is being protected. So you call it proof of care. And as I've said earlier, the communities don't actually get the funds unless they can prove that the forest is being protected. So all of this data could be fed into our platform. And using blockchain technologies, you can just have an algorithm that says, OK, and th this is a community-driven algorithm as well. It's uh, so you get all of the data, and you really make sure that that your that there is impact in the rainforest. And then we can use the blockchain technology to release this donation towards the communities, and it's continuous funding. So you can think of it as 
they can collect rent for for protecting their land you know um this is you know these are some camera images and we can upload it to you every month it engages the donors with the um with the pro specific projects th that they're interested in and we're really in trying to measure and value not just the carbon footprint um you asked the question about you know how do we how do we measure carbon footprint and i think this is a very interesting problem but also we need to make sure to remember that a forest is not just carbon it is also its biodiversity um, and making sure that the forest is actually being protected the impact is right now whereas if you decide to cut it down and then you decide to plant more trees the, it doesn't really start taking in carbon until until the tree matures so yeah we have a more holistic view viewpoint on <coughs> an environmental footprint um so not just carbon and how do you engage with donors and who can become the supporter of initiative or uh, the receiving side of the initiative? How can people who are um, mm -hmm. here listening to us or watching uh, this video recording can engage on a practical mm -hmm. level? So you can go into the platform and you can choose any of the projects that you would be interested in. And we have projects in four different countries. So in Brazil, in Paraguay, in Bhutan and in the Philippines. Um, and these are all very different projects with very different ecosystems. And once you don't decide to donate, um, or whether you are a person, an ev individual, or you're a business, you will get as a receipt of your donation an NFT. And in this NFT, it's very, very visual. It shows the the biodiversity it's it's 3d we have a really great artist and you can it also changes depending on on ground conditions so maybe the seasons change or maybe the water level it goes up during the rainy season or it goes down and you can see this very visually and you can also get access once you purchase this nft you will get access to wildlife cameras um, you'll get access to drone data. So this way you can really, really see and engage. You can, you can think of it a little bit as ecotourism, ecotourism from a distance. Because ecotourism, you go uh, to that specific area, maybe you have to take a plane, and then you have to build hotels or houses for people to live in, and then you're exploiting the natural resources and we don't want to exploit natural resources. We want to really preserve and protect what we have on land. And this is a way for people to be able to engage with the area without necessarily having to be there. Thank you. This is brilliant. And Alessandro, I know you also have a brilliant example of wildlife tracking. And I would like you to tell us more about the Kenya Hackathon and initiatives that Sovereign Nature is working on. Sure. Um, just um, a note, we talked a lot about numbers and impacts of technology on environment. I think, um, like for us, as soon as we got into, you know, the use using a Web3 for conservation and environmental uh, issues, like uh, it was a no-brainer, like similar to all of you, to, to just to look for uh, a chain that was, uh, they didn't have that impact. But beyond, um, which is the, the polka dot Kusama ecosystem, but beyond the just the impact on, on energy consumption, uh, what concerns me and concerns us a lot is also the impact on on the people that technology has and that we cannot see and predict that much. Um, so uh, the idea that, w that technology is value neutral and it doesn't, you know, and, and it's about how people use it, it changes it. I think it's, um, it's, it's a limited way of looking at it. So for us, the, the approach that we took in, in with this project in Kenya that I'll be talking about in a second is to have the people that will be using the technology participate in every single step on of how it's developed. 
um, because we're bringing in new capacities for governance, for decision making, for funding distri fund distribution and so on. And that those type of new, let's say, dynamics need to be embedded on practices that are already existing. Otherwise, we do, you know, the, the danger of um, uh, tech technological uh, uh, colonialism in some way it's really it's really there and when I spent a few weeks in, um, in, in in Kenya this last summer I I could see that people were you know uh, um, aware of the fact that technology arrived before already it was sold to them many times and that really changed the dynamics of how they actually lived with each other and with wildlife so um, beyond the energy consumption, again, like I think it's a good caveat to make is like technology, we should be careful and we should take a participatory approach, meaning hearing the people first before we, we give them any type of technology in their hands to use. Um, so the Kenya project, as I mentioned in my introduction, we partnered uh, a year ago with the Kenya Wildlife Trust, which is the uh, leading organization doing uh, conservation work of predators, especially in the Masai Mara and wider um, Masai Mara ecosystem. And um, as we, we came with the question of what is what is what are you struggling with in terms of technology, right? What is what is the capacity that needs to be built to help uh, your um, the conservation work? And they come up with a couple of challenges that were very technical. One was on uh, lion identification and um, the art, which is a machine learning AI type of uh, challenge. And um, and the second one was on a mitigation of conflicts between humans and uh, wildlife and in specific predators like lions and hyenas that um, y you have to imagine the, the, the Masai Mara as a mixed land, uh, land use uh, environment whereby the you have herder communities, you have some farming, you have wildlife conservation organizations and so on. So there's, there are all these interests that oftentimes are conflicting with each other pressure of uh, population growth, uh, uh, the climate and so on is also making the problem even worse and worse at the time uh, as the time goes, like uh, droughts for instance, um, make, make it so all these stakeholders are sort of concentrating in, in, s in very specific places. So we were faced with this challenge and um, uh, as, as we learned about the work that these people were doing, we, we found out that um, the the amount of data that these uh, organizations were collecting was huge and what was telling us was that uh, we, we mentioned proof of care right like the, that in some way there was an incredible amount of work being done that no one was actually in around the world that was able to see only the few philanthropists that were supporting the, the organization or I mean the tourists also didn't know that because this is again like a financial uh, a way for, for these uh, communities to, to make uh, money by protecting the, the, the environment through and they get money through tourism. So we wanted to make these efforts, this work of this conservation and this all this data that was coming out of, of the work uh, publicly available to people so that we could create at least an effect, a type of like emotional connection with the work they were doing. Because Kenya Wildlife Trust, for instance, had 18 um, or 15 um, lion ambassadors, as they call them. These are people that are paid full time and often the number goes down depending on fund uh, um, uh, availability. But they walk eight to 10 hours a day, every day for six days a week. Um, basically monitoring wildlife, monitoring people, communities, herders, to make sure that we avoid conflict. And a conflict means oftentimes retaliation, meaning that the lion gets killed after he killed a cow. So all this data was standing in an offline database that only the organization would be able to access. And there are concerns, of course, on privacy and on access to the data, because it's very sensitive data. You don't want to tell you know, the whole world where exactly a lion is, right? But there's a lot of the data ca that will be also opened up and make it made available online. So as we, we are a technical company, but we also have a branch on uh, uh, with art and cultural engagement, we decided to create an art 
they would represent a piece of art, digital art they would represent um, these efforts that these, these, these communities were doing in conservation, plus also the proximity of uh, wildlife and humans and how much like you know um, this how, how real the problem is. So we started this project pretty very early before you know before the hackathon was was started, which is this technical competition, and before any like R and D tech projects were started, we started to look at what are the stories that these people tell. So we started to con uh, collect. I, I collected um, stories from people on the ground telling me what is the relationship with lions, and um, plus this old data, with tracking data, and so on. We've merged and this is an ongoing uh, project but we merged it into a digital as we call it sculpture where you can see the tracks of the people going around uh, and now the the trick and the magic is to to create this living nft or dynamic nft that you were talking about so that this piece of art continuously changes with the changes with the data that we get every day from from their efforts the purpose of this is to connect First of all, the hearts of people that want to, f let's say, contribute to the to the um, the care that these communities uh, very much spend to protect this uh, wild environment, and through that, attract funds that are not just like a one-time payment in in a black hole that no one knows where where your money goes, but is literally being able to track where this fund goes. And I mean, you you have explained it so well, so I won't be repeating what you said, but being able to to see that the funds had an impact on to um, on on the ground and um, and the level of transparency of course is very important because that would basically back to back to my introduction on web3 and and culture what what we are what web3 is promising and um, it's problematic at times but I think it's also a very uh, strong principle is that we won't need a middleman so we want we're cutting the trust or moving the trust from humans or, or, in, or institutions to technology and code and data. Um, I think the layer of uh, you know, transcending the human trust won't ever happen, but I think uh, being able to trust the technology is what Web3 is about, and this is uh, opening a lot of opportunities to, to really uh, create, create a lot of impact and, again, um, being able to fund what is actually really meaningful. Um, uh, thank you, Alessandro. This is uh, actually a very important topic that I wanted to also touch upon today. Uh, Web3 promises decentralization, empowerment, uh, bringing your power back in terms of you owning your data, um, controlling how your data is used tracking all the transactions you make on the internet and the promise of uh, Web3 Foundation and Polkadot ecosystem is less trust, more truth. Uh, but important factor here is that we're talking about peer-to-peer -peer transaction and I like to call it human to human because we are not eliminating human presence and human factor when it comes to technology. Technology is just a technology it is something there, um, lines of codes, but how we use it, how we implement it, what we input in it depends on us because we still have people creating that code. Um, so we are in the role of creators and that is the most beautiful thing that human beings can do, create. And second most important thing we can do is to communicate. And the way we communicate on the internet is very important and is evolving with the tools evolving. Uh, and today we are um, here in the framework of the reconciliation with the living art exhibition and art is one of the communication mediums. It allows us to talk to each other, to talk to the artwork, um, it recalls our deep feelings, it recalls our sense of beauty, and we also have other mediums like music, theater, um, readings, books. So I want to ask um, all the panelists today, how do you think, what is the importance of the art in the technology Web3 and NFT space? Um, 
and how that helps us to create the dialogue and improve our relations with environment. Okay. Um, so yeah, the the importance of art in uh, in all the Web three world and, F and, 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 and oh, NFT world. Um, so I I think it's uh, really a way to uh, enter in uh, in this world in the to 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 reconciliate yeah, the the technology and the the human and our sensitivity. Um, it's a part of uh, entering into a, a world that we may not understand totally at first, uh, but just because uh, we were used to to see art to to communicate with uh, with it, uh, we're not uh, necessarily used to to the world of Web three in general, um, and yeah, it's a way to get uh, all this new technology uh, and all this new approach. Uh, more widely known and <coughs> more widely uh, accepted and integrated in uh, in our life, um, and about the the impact of it, uh, I think that actually it can be uh, really huge in in some parts, uh, since uh, art is expressing with with our feelings or with ourselves. Uh, it's something that we really can uh, appropriate to us uh, in a very um, personal way, uh, and so it, it can it can bring very new people and people that we wouldn't expect uh, around all the subjects into the subject and integrate uh, a, re a really large community of people and of actors and of companies. Uh, inside the, the same project to achieve uh, a, a goal that we couldn't achieve without uh, the the help of everyone and uh, yeah I think that's I think art is a very powerful way to engage the donors with the ecosystem so each NFT is a related to a project and it dis depicts the unique ecosystem and the animals that's inside there. It's also just a, it's kind of just fun. It kind of humanizes it a little bit. A and because we work with so many varying ecosystems, so uh, the Amazonian rainforest, the kind of dry air forests in Paraguay, uh, the mountainous forest regions in Bhutan or the mangroves in the Philippines. So as a, as an individual, it also I incentivizes you to donate to different projects. You can kind of collect collect different ecosystems, um, and so it's it's just a, f a really fun way you can. So like your your art portfolio doesn't just consist of one specific type of ecosystem, but you can really see the um the mountains the ocean the the rainforest and it just it's very easy to share also to to the world you know hey i'm protecting uh the environment these are the ecosystems it's very very visual so you can share it on social media and generate conversation um yeah thanks um well we are in paris and uh, i think Bruno Latour passed away uh, a few months ago and I think like there's a quote hanging upstairs that sort of been following me since I saw it yesterday where paraphrasing basically says like you cannot we cannot engage the public um, without art if we try to send a message about you know the ecological crisis or ecological beauty we cannot <laughs> we cannot do that without art and um, like this was the the reason why we we started this uh, this art project alongside um, 
um, you know, the, the more uh, R&D technical projects in Kenya was that we wanted to um, to merge science and data with art and making making that available to to people to trigger an emotional connection, empathy, compassion for the work. Actually. Uh, we started to use the word relationship more than just human, non-human. Is the re really what we're trying to do is to create this empathy for the relationship that there is in there that stays that remains in between the um, the human and wildlife and the cattle and 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 the land and the soil. And so, how do you do that? You you can write a, a scientific report about it, but who will read it? Who will engage with it? Or even would uh, would ever engage in uh, people in a way that will then motivate a commitment or or, or an action towards it. Um, the project is called Tracing the Wild, and what we did is so not only data as I explained before, but also these stories that I've collected uh, from these people basically create this immersive experience uh, where you are immersed in the in the uh, in the problem in the challenge that these people are facing, uh, I cannot uh, see other ways of doing it than through 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 art. You know, the first time I saw them, and again, this is still in the making. Um, we're trying to find the the best way to to represent this. But the first time I saw the first representation, which basically was a beautiful um, visualization of the tracks of the of these people walking around with with their phones with a special application called cyber tracker where they collect the data about the observations they make plus all the conflicts and color data from the lions the first time i saw this this um, the something got triggered in me whereby even though i spent time with these people that that care that i saw live first person when I was with them was brought back by that artistic image that I saw. So when we were talking about, you know, like uh, art becoming a way to connect um, from distance remotely, I think this is this is the, the most powerful uh, um, way, I think, of using art for conservation, for, for uh, to engage the public in climate crisis, um, yeah. So it's uh, and and the fact that now we can make that art continuously changing, it becomes alive. So we we're talking about connecting with the living, and I think technology is becoming like this. This dichotomy between technology and life is really becoming very blurred, whereby you can create tech, digital art, digital assets that are. The, re the real representation of what's happening on the ground. I think it's it's beautiful. Um, it's, it's something to be looking forward to. And then if you can connect funding to it, it's uh, it can be a very, very powerful tool. Thank you for sharing. Um, this is really moving and beautiful experiences that you, the projects that you're working with. And I would like to express a gratitude to Benjamin Benita, uh, the president of Culture for Causes Network, thanks to who the exhibition and this talk today is happening um, at the UNESCO. And to Matthew, who brought all our artists, generative artists together, um, our panelists together. And this project, Reconciliation with the Living, is a great example of decentralization, um, technology and art applied for impact, for creating awareness. Uh, and the very important part of this project is that it was created over conversation during um, sustainability summit here in Paris in July. And five months later, we're sitting here we're exhibiting um, amazing artworks during the Earth Day here. And the initiative was funded via the Treasury in a decentralized way. When um, one can submit a proposal and then token holders of specific network and specific Treasury can vote on that proposal with their tokens and decide to execute 
um, the initiative and to uh, fund the initiative. Token holders can be anybody. So this new process of governments, governance on the blockchain uh, is meant to be democratical and inclusive. And the blockchain technology is all about, the promise of it is about inclusivity and decentralization. And we also have a very important concept, reality emerging these days, which is called the metaverse. And I would like to conclude our panel today with a discussion around the metaverse. What is metaverse for you? And how do you see it developing? What are the challenges? And what shall be uh, done to improve it and to really build the space we, we all dream about? Um, I'll just share a couple of remarks. Last year, we worked with uh, Being Crypto magazine. And we published a series of articles on the metaverse, metaverse and space exploration. And back then I shared, metaverse was a very new concept, and I shared my dream that the metaverse becomes that experimental environment because it gives us the opportunity to, for example, build digital twins, buildings, uh, cities, virtual worlds, where we can test things before we implement them into real life which significantly decreases the cost of operation and which actually allows us to create things that maybe will never exist in the real world. But these things, they trigger our imagination. Um, they engage us in the dialogue. They bring us all together to, f to seek solutions for real world problems. And in the world of today, um, I think it is super important to dream to dream the better world, because if you dream the world you want to live in, you can actually achieve it, you can build it. It is very architectural approach, and um, as, as an architect, I'm excited about this opportunity, because you can test any kind of concepts and then actually apply real economy to that metaverse. You can make people happier, you can deliver value, you can deliver social impact, and you can communicate and establish connection and get actually closer together digitally without needing to travel in space and um, produce CO2 when flying, for example. So uh, what are your views on the metaverse? Uh, so actually, I think I'm currently building my, uh, my opinion on metaverse, but what I can share is that I agree with you that it can be a very powerful way to implement new solutions and test things that couldn't be done without it. Um, I, when a, a technology uh, emerge, I'm always careful with all the impact behind it. Uh, and I think Metaverse, uh, we have to be very careful with uh, all the impact behind it uh, because it can be um, it can use a lot of uh, compute powers, uh, the same as the, the blockchain once when uh, when it emerged. Uh, so we have to be very careful around it to build it, uh, build the, the metaverse the right way, uh, and taking everything into account. Uh, and I'm questioning myself about the the direction it's the metaverse is taking. Uh, for me, some applications should be, might be very useful with the metaverse, uh, testing things uh, inside of it. It can reduce cost, ca it can reduce uh, the time spent on projects, it, it can reduce the impact of projects. Uh, some applications are, I think, not uh, necessarily uh, what we want to do with the metaverse. Uh, if we want to uh, build marketing strategies or uh, do, for example, uh, professional interviews through Metaverse. Uh, those applications, I'm not sure that it's uh, the best way to use it and the, the right way to use it. Uh, because in terms of impact, uh, at least for the moment, it uh, could lead to uh, really 
uh, really high impact in terms of CO2, in terms of carbon emissions. Um, so yeah, my point is that we really have to be careful while building it. It can be really useful in, in all our projects management, uh, but we have to think globally about all the, the advantages, drawbacks and uh, consequences of, of a, a new technology. Thank you. If I were to really dream, um, so <laughs> about five minutes ago you were talking about the relationship of um, someone on the other side of the world could have with the environment just through the art and the visual imagery and connecting that data to on-ground data, uh, the image to on-ground data. And I think if we can create even more immersive experiences and more create even more engagement. And you cannot really act on something that you cannot see, that you don't really even know is happening. If there's a forest fire, you don't, you know, you can read about it in the newspaper, but it's very different when you can see this in your NFT or if you can see this in the metaverse, if you can really um, see the impacts um with like what what's currently happening with the animals that's on the land with the people that's on the land what are the stories that they're telling and all of this information can be conveyed in a very compelling and an immersive way in a way that really encourages action and i think this is one way that we can use the metaverse for good thank you yeah, I, I agree with, uh, with with definitely your your uh, proposal. Like, just let's be careful with it. So, um, the metaverse to me, let's start with what is not is not uh, an augmented version of Second Life or anything like it, where we can just transcend our lives and and interests and desires into a three D space. <laughs> like that's probably the, the worst nightmare for me. Um, I still, I agree. Like I agree. I'm, I'm, I resonate with you. I'm still trying to find um, an, an understanding of what the metaverse is. Uh, what Mark Zuckerberg has sold us is not what I want, um, and I think he realized that. Um, that is not good for society. Um, so the metaverse, to me, right now, I'm sitting on. I talked before about uh, this idea that Web three can create value decoupled and again like I mean not fully decoupled there's all still energy consumption and so on but let's say way more uh, de detached from the use and extraction and exploitation of uh, natural resources so if that's the case that uh, we can create um, digital assets that create value uh, that um, for art right like art is one example um, that then can live in a, in, a, in a space where all this digital, digital asset is naturally to me the place is a metaverse um, and then the idea is that through this digital world 3d world that we have built that connects to the to the ground that then th whatever value is generated there can be then distributed to uh, to have impact on on uh, on projects um, you know, in the field, conservation and uh, regeneration and so on. So what I'm hearing here is that the most important thing the metaverse can help us achieve is communication and connection. Uh, is this transfer of value that we all create as a society and to build bridges and be more efficient in distributing this value and distributing in delivering where the value really needs to be delivered in this specific moment of time. Um, often also when we talk about climate change and climate, climate crisis, we hear these messages, we are doing it for the future, we're building it for the future, and often I feel like we are forgetting the present, but our future is built in the present, so we need to be very conscious of what, how we live today, how we communicate today, how we build the reality today in this specific moment so our tomorrow is better. And to close this panel, I would like to take this unique opportunity and 
ask you to leave the message for humanity because we are at UNESCO. Uh, this is a very unique moment in history because we are building a history in the Web3. We have a unique opportunity to fix things that were not working um, in Web2, to dream the new world we want to build, and to come together in a dialogue and identify what are the real needs, what are the important issues for all of us we want to work on, what are important things we want to all build together. And it's not just about the tech companies, because often the perception is, oh, if you want to get into blockchain, you need to learn to code and you need to be a developer. Um, it is not exactly true. We need entrepreneurs, we need dreamers, we need artists, musicians, policy makers, lawyers, to come together to have this common ground, common space for uh, conversation. And Web3 is all about conversation and community and change things, make things better. So your message to humanity from UNESCO today. Uh, my message would be to dream, to share your dreams and to make them happen. I think <coughs> we can do a lot of good once we collaborate together. And so my message would be work on what appeals to you, what is, we, we still have hope and if you all work together as, as one, we can really achieve a lot of great things. Um, yeah, the message to humanity. Um, I think appreciating this quality that we have as humans to feel like such a great, uh, such an intense uh, connection for others, like uh, you that we can call empathy, is something which we should cherish. And I think that's the starting point from where we can start to then reimagine, uh, you know, how a better future, more desirable, life-sustaining future in partnership with, you know, the living could look like. So that's my message. To try to remember how to appreciate the beauty of life through any means and then from that place go and reach out to communities to, to start to reinvent a new story uh, about you know how we should be as humans in relationship to the non-human world. Thank you um, for this beautiful discussion today. Uh, Web3 is about community Web3 is about taking responsibility. And the role of human is the role of a cre creator. And being a creator means also being responsible for your creation and for the actions you take every day, every second. So thank you for awakening, for being present, for building, for delivering value to the society. And once again, a sincere thank you to Benjamin and Matthew for making this um, exhibition and this talk possible today. Um, thank you for joining this talk and we'll see you at the exhibition Reconciliation with the Living. Thank you to panelists and this, uh, that's a wrap. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>